I hope that was as illuminating to you as it was to me. I, I love that video. I think it explains so well just who God is and, and, and what his holiness means, what that looks like, and, and, and the significant scripture passages that, that relate to that. But for us, we need to ask ourselves the question, what does God's holiness and perfection have to do with us? Well, first of all, we need to remember the context. The context is love. The context is love, because that's what God is. God is love. Not love is God, because that's, that's a different thing. But God is love, not love is God. But we also need to remember, remembering the context of, uh, of God is love, we also need to remember what Oswald Chambers said. And, and it may be very difficult to remember something you've never heard, so we're going to hear what he says. Oswald Chambers says, Anything that belittles or obliterates the holiness of God by a false view of the love of God is untrue to the revelation of God given by Jesus Christ. See, this is what I mean when we don't say that love is God, but God is love. In a way, there are some folks who, who sort of say love is God, and, and by doing so, they almost seem to be separating other attributes of God, like his righteousness and holiness and his perfection and so on. Uh, they seem to strip those away and, and get to some concept of love equaling God, but that's not quite the way it is. We need to recognize God is love. Yes, absolutely. But you cannot separate out the idea of God's holiness and perfection from that reality of who God is. So that's, first of all, we need to remember the context of God's love. But secondly, we must remember that apart from God working in our lives, God's holiness would obliterate us. Just as we saw in the Bible passages of, uh, uh, on the, the Bible Project's video where Moses is afraid to see God and God warns him not to come any closer, or Isaiah recognizes his uncleanness. And uh, Ezekiel as well, um, if you look at that passage, we must remember that we are unclean because of our sin and rebellion. And because of God's holiness and righteousness and our uncleanness, apart from God, we would be obliterated by his holiness. Billy Graham said that only when we understand the holiness of God will we understand the depth of our sin. And that is really, really important. As I was reading and preparing for this service, uh, someone else, and I, I, I'm sorry, I can't remember where I got this from, but someone else uh, was mentioned as saying, if I could, I would take away this whole preaching of the way of salvation for a few years, because we have cheapened it in some significant ways. And instead, I would preach for a long time, for, for a few years, about the holiness and righteousness of God. And in doing so, I would, I would keep on, I would persist, until the people cry out, How can we be saved? And then, I would pull them aside, one by one and speak to them of the salvation of God through Jesus Christ. When we do not understand the holiness of God, it can seem too easy or too inexpensive to approach God. 
without understanding how wretched we are without him, we cannot realize how significant it is that through Jesus, we can approach our Father in heaven safely. We need to also hear along with that what sin is. John Piper, again, a famous uh, Reformed theologian and pastor, he says, what is sin? It is the glory of God not honored, the holiness of God not reverenced, the greatness of God not admired, the power of God not praised, the truth of God not sought, the wisdom of God not esteemed, the beauty of God not treasured, the goodness of God not savored, the faithfulness of God not trusted, the commandments of God not obeyed the justice of God not respected, the wrath of God not feared, the grace of God not cherished, the presence of God not prized, and the person of God not loved. This is sin. Thirdly, we must see that to love God properly is to desire holiness. Be holy as I am holy, says the Lord. Charles Spurgeon put it this way, another famous theologian. I'm full of famous theologians today. Uh, Charles Spurgeon put it this way, I would sooner be holy than happy if the two things could be divorced, which they can't. Were it possible for a person always to sorrow and yet to be pure, I would choose the sorrow if I might win the purity. For to be free from the power of sin, to be made to love holiness, is true happiness. And lastly, brothers and sisters, we must remember that God's entire plan for humanity and his desire for us as individuals, too, is to be restored to holiness. This is what Oswald Chambers said. God has one desired end for humanity, holiness. God's one aim is the production of saints, God is not an eternal blessing machine for people. God did not come to save people out of pity. God came to save people because God created them to be holy. Brothers and sisters, this is what we were called to be. This is what we were created to be right from the beginning. This is what we were meant for. And so in understanding the holiness of God, we can begin to understand its implications for us. The depth of our sin, the, the need for holiness, how essential it is for us to love and desire holiness, and how only God, through Jesus Christ and the ongoing work of the Holy Spirit, can provide us with holiness and transform us by the renewing of our minds and everything else about us into the holy people that he has called us to be. Let us pray brothers and sisters. Father in heaven, thank you so very much for creating us in your image, for creating us to be holy. Lord, thank you so very much that in spite of our fall into sin, you did not simply wash your hands of us and cast us out into the outer darkness. But instead, you sent your Son, who became sin and uncleanness for us, that we could be redeemed and become holy again. 
Help us, O oh God, to long for holiness. Help us, O oh God, to live in holiness. Help us, O oh God, in short, to be holy just as you are holy. We stand in awe of you, O oh God. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.